Well, let me invite you to get your Bibles out and turn with me to the book of the Revelation and also uh, 1 John 2 and uh, then Mark chapter 13, verse 6. Uh, as I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, uh, uh, you know, one of the ways that God imprints and impresses upon his servant what to speak, it, sometimes it begins with a thought, sometimes it begins with uh, just a, a word, and then he continually guides. And I really had not even thought in the last, uh, uh, be honest with you, last Wednesday that I would be going this direction. Uh, but it seemed like it gravitated that way. And, and you know, the world that you and I are living in, you can't help but uh, ask the question, how far along are we on in the pendulum of time? How close are we to the end days? How close are we to the final hour? Well, nobody knows that. You know, you will hear some who will give a speculation as I was studying on Revelation, as I was studying on the Antichrist and uh, preparing for tonight. It was interesting, some of the uh, articles I came across, a uh, number of articles and audios and others that I came across, uh, shared why the Antichrist will be revealed on August the 20th, 2016. Now, I thought that was quite interesting because I hadn't seen that anywhere, but more than one uh, location had that. Now, I'm not saying that's going to take place, but I am telling you this, that the Bible makes it very clear and has made it very clear for thousands of years that there is going to come a time on the world stage when the rise of the Antichrist is going to come. I want you to follow along with me in the first nine verses of Revelation uh, chapter 13 and then 1 John 2. Find it in your copy of the scripture. And listen to what God says through his servant and to his servant, John. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months." And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all the kindred and tongues and nations. Now that's significant. In other words, he has a world-dominating power. He is going to rule the earth. And all that dwell on the earth, notice the phrasing, all, all that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. And then if you'll turn over to 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, John is telling to the saints of God, he is reminding them that the hour of the time of the Antichrist has come and is come. In other words, the stages are set. Little children, it is the last time. Now, notice what he says carefully. It is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, before I get into the next passage of Scripture, let me qualify something that uh, John says. Whenever he says it is the last time, the reference to the last time began at the cross. In other words, from the cross until the day the Lord comes, it is the last time era. There was the day of the Gentiles. There is uh, the day that uh, was the fulfillment at the cross. And the last time is all of the space after from the cross on to the conclusion of the age. So John is saying it is the last time. 
You might could even say it this way. It is the last time era. We are in the last time. We are in the last days. We are in that time, that motion that is going to set the stage. And so John is saying, little children, I want you to be aware. I want you to be in the know. I don't want you to be shocked. I want you to be aware that the Antichrist shall come. 2,000 years ago, John the Apostle, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, made it very clear to the saints of God that the Antichrist shall come. Now, that was the name given to him. That was the name John gave to him because that is who he is going to be. He is going to be totally against Christ and everything that Christ stands for. And then Mark chapter 13, verse 6. Listen to what... uh, God says through Mark, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, I want you to listen before we get into the first point, because there's so many things I want to share, and I may not get all the time tonight, but we'll get as far as we can and then stop, and so we'll have plenty of time, because I want you to really absorb. You know, the time will come on the earth when there will be one ultimate earthly ruler. There will come a world stage in which there will be a one world ruler. The Bible bears it out. You can go all the way back to the book of Daniel chapter 7. If you want to read Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8, it's mentioned through the Old Testament, but nobody speaks of it as specifically as God does through Daniel when he makes it very clear what is going to come down the pike of time. And when you look at Scripture... The Bible has declared in the Old Testament, New Testament, that the stage is going to be set. And uh, and as I mentioned, from time to time, people have tried to get, people have tried to say, you know, it's going to come uh, on this date. I mentioned the date uh, that uh, I have heard some people guess at. Uh, Nobody knows the day and the hour in which the Antichrist will rise up. But I am going to give you some very specifics that are outlined in Scripture So you will know that uh, when he comes. And there will be a generation that will be alive. My understanding of scripture is that the church is going to be taken up. We're going to be raptured. How do you know that? Because when you get to Revelation chapter 3, that space between Revelation 3 and 4, you find the church no longer mentioned. The church is not mentioned until you get to Revelation chapter 19 as we studied when we went through the Revelation. Now... You know, whenever you look in Scripture, you know, much is on the heart of John, much is on the heart of Paul, much is on their heart to share about the Antichrist because the truth about it is we need to be aware. We need to understand why things are escalating the way they are. Folks, if you will look at Scripture and if you will read Scripture and study Scripture, you will understand why the world is escalating into ungodliness the way it is. How many times do you and I say something like this? I just can't believe how ungodly our world is becoming. Well, that is the setup for the time for the one world leader that's going to take place. We have to become and we will become and we have become more ungodly. We are more satanic in nature. Now, I'm not talking that you see people with Ouija boards and practicing witchcraft, but I can tell you this. Uh, you know, the Bible makes it very clear that a person can be under the control of Satan and they may not even think a thing about it. They're doing his bidding. And, uh, and, and that's the way the world is. That's the world that we're living in. But you may say, well, why are we taking time to study about the Antichrist? Why are we doing that? Well, first of all, it's in Scripture. And if there's something you and I need to be reoriented over and over and over again, it is to this sobering and yet significant truth of Scripture. You know, uh, Paul made it very clear in Thessalonians. John makes it clear in the Revelation and it's made clear that, that it is going to come. He is going to rise on the world stage. And so we need to be mindful of it. And God wants us to be on our guard. When you start understanding Scripture, when you start realizing some of these truths in Scripture, it shouldn't shell shock you. It shouldn't shell shock you that seemingly normal people are going off the deep end. Seemingly leaders that you had respect in and confidence in, what in the world is going on? The Bible says uh, makes a very interesting phrase because uh, whenever you look in Scripture and you start understanding the satanic activity of the devil, uh, it, it gets very sobering. You remember the Bible said in the New Testament that Satan entered into Peter. In other words, there was a time in which, uh, uh, you know, or entered into Judas Iscariot, I mean. And when Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, what did he do? He betrayed Jesus and uh, he did his bidding. Meaning that Satan can enter 
person. He can enter individuals. As a matter of fact, the Bible makes it very clear. Satan and his demons, they would much rather live in a human being or in an animal. They don't like to live in arid places. They like to live in a person or an animal. And so, but God wants us to be on our, our guard. And one of the most significant places that uh, uh, you and I see the evidence of Antichrist in our world and in our culture, think about it, is Christmas. If there is a, a time that pervades Antichrist, isn't it around Christmas? You know, you see, you know, no more Christmas trees, no, no more uh, nativities rather, no more this, no more that. Uh, why? Because we don't want to offend anybody. No, what is happening is it is the escalation of satanic activity. Now, I'm not meaning that to be negative, but I'm just telling you from the truth of Scripture. Because the stage has to be set before the Antichrist can come. There has to be the necessary propaganda preceding the Antichrist. There has to be the necessary uh, things that are set in motion. So I want you to get your outline out and follow along with me because we are, bec we are growing more Antichrist and more Antichrist culture. I mean, think about it. How many of you, and I've said it before, but, but it's, it's worth repeating. How many of us uh, have never thought we would lose the common sense we've lost? I mean, common sense. I mean, now common sense is out the window. You do what you want to do, when you want to do it, the way you want to do it, and don't bother me. Why? Because it's setting up the motion for the Antichrist. But let's just look at the stage leading to the Antichrist. Now, God and Satan, let me give you this. God and Satan have always been at war. Satan has always been at war with God. He's always hated God. He's always despised God because he wants what God has. He wants the throne on which God sits. And so since Satan hates God, now listen carefully, he hates anything and anybody that belongs to God. He hates anything that God has initiated. He wants to thwart it. And forever authentic that God has started, Satan has a counterfeit. Uh, just as God had his Moses, Satan has John S. and John Breeze. Just as God had Peter, Satan had Judas Iscariot. And uh, just as there is a trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, there is a satanic trinity. Principalities, powers, and rulers of wickedness. Now, I say that to say, you and I need to understand the stage that is set. Back in the beginning of, of Eden, it wasn't just Adam, uh, you know, Satan trying to uh, usurp Adam and Eve. It wasn't just aimed at man and woman. Satan despised the creation of mankind. He despised God's handiwork. That's why you're tempted. That's why Satan bothers you. Uh, do you ever think, well, man, I, I didn't think the Christian life was going to be this challenging. It's, the, it's challenging because we always are going to have uh, principalities and powers that we war against on a regular basis. And so Satan has always launched attacks on Christ, on his children, all the way back in the Old Testament, Satan was trying to, to stop the coming of the Messiah. That's why uh, the children uh, were killed. That's why persecution has uh, been a part of Satan's scheme. Because he wants to stop what God has started. Satan wants to destroy the nation of Israel. You stop and think about it. What nation is more attacked throughout history than the nation of Israel? And what other nation is attacked because we are aligned with Israel? It's the United... Well, you know, we, we need to let Israel fight their own battles, some say. No, we better not. Here's what God makes very clear. He who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor does he sleep, and his name is Jehovah God. God is always... And God said in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. So... Satan expressed hatred toward God by attacking his creation. Satan hates to redeem mankind. Satan hates you. He is going to do everything he can to usurp you. He's going to try to be ruthless to you. He's going to do whatever he can in his dirt to, to wear you out. As a matter of fact, that's what the Antichrist is going to do uh, in his time frame. You know... It led him through the centuries to strike at God's crowning creation. Satan did everything he could to destroy Christ uh, by killing him at the cross. He didn't want him to rise from the dead. He did everything he can. And here's what you need to understand. 
Satan has always been against God. And the picture is, there has been a universal war, and it has, and it's going to play itself out in the Battle of Armageddon, in the Valley of Megiddo. It, sin is going to have its ultimate culmination, and it's going to be done away with forever. You know, Satan couldn't defeat Christ, but here's what he does. He brings a, a steady phony number of messiahs through the ages. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew? You know, many will say in that day, many will, there will be many messiahs, there will be many phonies, is the essence of the verse. In other words, there will be many that will come in my name. And so it's been the goal of Satan through the centuries to stop anything that God starts. And so Satan's goal is to launch an all-out attack, and he's going to do it, and he's going to do it through the Antichrist. Why? Because you remember in the end, Jesus Christ comes and he rules on the earth in his kingdom, right? What does Satan want to do? He wants to stop the whole process. And so uh, it will be the desire of Satan's Antichrist to make war with the saints. And you can look at that in Revelation chapter 13, verse, verse 7. As a matter of fact, here's what it says. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, the power given over all the kindred of the nations and tongues. Now let me explain something before I go any further. You say, now pastor, you said the church has been raptured by the time, but here he's making war with the saints. Yes. A person who is a saint is a person who is in Christ. But the ecclesia, the body, the church that God established, Jesus established, will have been ushered up. There will be many that will be saved in the tribulation. How do you know that? Because there are 12,000 that are sealed out of the tribes of Israel. There are 144,000 evangelists that are taking the gospel of Christ to the ends of the earth in that day and time. So, you know, and so how, does, uh, how is the satanic antichrist going to come? Well, it really comes by some things that... I was listening to a Jewish uh, uh, rabbi last night, and, uh, and he gave some marks of some benchmarks along the way that have been the undoing uh, of... that has led us to where we are. Uh, there was a number, number of them. I can't recall all of them. But anyway, in his, in his uh, dissertation, he was talking about the different benchmarks that have taken place. Uh, he was talking about uh, just the uh, cavalier, casual attitude that there has become, uh, the disregard for the Word of God that has come, uh, the erosion and the erosion of sexual promiscuity that has come. Uh, John MacArthur says that the sexual revolution has been the tremendous thing that started in the 60s. You see, we're not where we are because it started yesterday. Back in the 60s when so many different things changed and so many different things took place and, and, uh, and styles and music and all of that. And all of these things have had their way in, in the process. And so, uh, but here's the reality. It starts when a nation continually turns away from God. And, and that's what's happening. You know, uh, we have nation, we are a nation that is continually turning away from God, and there's going to be continually turning away from God, disregard for God, disregard. As a matter of fact, uh, Dr. John MacArthur, and listening to uh, him just the other day, and he was doing some studies on the Antichrist, and there will come a time when there will be many who claim to be Christians, and they'll say, they don't believe this book anymore. And I can tell you that that time is, because a lot of people, now we may say what we want to say, but how many people do you know really want, want to live their life by the Bible? Think about it. How many people really put stock in the, in the validity and the truths and the authenticity of the Word? How many people believe that the Bible says what it says and means what it means? And you see a lot of people, well, you say, well, there's a lot of people. No, watch their life. A lot of people don't believe they're going to reap what they sow or they'd stop sowing some stuff. Right? I mean, a lot of people are doing stuff with their life and their body, and they say, well, you know, I believe the Bible. No, you don't. You don't believe the Bible. Why? Because you don't believe you're going to reap what you sow. Well, you know, I don't know if that holds true all the time. God's Word is absolute. Let me give you an example. And this is not in your outline, but just... Do you know that a, a, a scientist did a study of just eight prophecies in Scripture? Let me give you an example. 
When you find a prophecy, that is a declaration that something is or is not going to take place. And uh, this uh, scientist said, for eight prophecies to be given hundreds of years beforehand and then to actually take place. This is only eight prophecies. And the Bible is full of hundreds of prophecies. He said that is like uh, a calculation of like uh, one ten to the seventeenth power. And here's how I explained it. For something like that to come true, it's like putting a sil- silver dollars in the state of Texas up to your ankles, and on one of those silver dollars you have a uh, you have a sharp mark on it. And on one time, now think about it, the whole state of Texas is covered in silver dollars up to your ankles, and one time, one time only, you pick, you reach down and pick up that one that has that sharpie mark on it. He said that is the probability of eight prophecies holding true, uh, except, he said, here's what you have. You have God as the author, and so God knows what's going to take place. And so here's, here's the point. Is there an antichrist that's coming? Yes. How do you know? Because God has already seen him. He's already risen in the mind and the heart of holy God. So the stage is set, and uh, the Old Testament uh, gives us bits and pieces, but I want to read to you a verse out of Daniel. It's not in your outline, but listen to what Daniel says. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came uh, up among them another little horn, behold whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great words. Now what is happening? God is using Daniel hundreds and hundreds of years ago to announce to the world stage the Antichrist is coming. And I'll get to some of the explanations of some of the words in that. But what God is making very clear, the stage is set. The stage has been set from the beginning of the age. The stage is continually being set. And by the way, God even said through Daniel, there's going to be seven world powers that's going to occupy the world. Did you know that? Now, you say, what do you mean world powers? Now, the United States is not a world power or not a kingdom as the Bible says. In other words, the whole world don't bow down to the United States. There have been five kingdoms that have already been, and John said one is and another one is to come, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, one is the Medes, one's the Persians, one's the Egyptians, one's the Greeks, and uh, uh, there was another one, and John said one is, and it was Rome, and he said there is going to be a revival of the Roman nation. And uh, there's going to be a ten-nation confederacy. How do you know that? Because God gave to Daniel prophecy of the world that is to come. But here's what I want you to understand. The stage is being set. The world is becoming more anti-Christ. The world is becoming more against Christ. The more, Listen, I remember someone said some years ago, they said it was a popular thing to be in church. They were talking about the church they attend. They said it's more popular to be in church than it was not to be in church. But the stage is becoming more and more set. Why? Look at what's going on. Look at what people are believing. Look what people are saying. Well, it's all right. You know, it just depends on what your belief system is. And so that's the setting of the stage in part. And uh, so God through Daniel uses space all through all the way back to point out to the coming universal ro- uh, world leader. And uh, the good news is he's not going to win, but you need to understand he's coming. Now, second of all, There are some prototypes in history that uh, give us some pictures of the coming Antichrist. Now, what's a prototype? Prototype is a miniature of the real thing that is going to come. Uh, There have been numerous, numerous wicked leaders on the world stage. If you would ask them, are you being used of Satan? They probably, I don't know if they'd say yes or no, they'd probably be so indifferent. But uh, they're just you know, egotistical and vain and self-centered. But uh, down through the centuries, and I only want to point to two tonight, because one was a ruler that so many people use as a benchmark to, uh, to look back at him and say, the coming Antichrist will be somewhat similar to this man. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes was a Greek ruler around the year 168 uh, B.C., The word epiphanies means great one. In other words, uh, he wanted everyone to bow down and call him great. And uh, yet many people called him epimine, which means uh, maniac. And that's what he was. Let me just tell you a little bit about what he did. Uh, He made it a crime to own a copy of the law. 
It was a crime to own a copy of the law. In other words, he rendered people ignorant. He wanted people rendered ignorant. Does that sound familiar? That was his goal, that people would live and operate in ignorance, that they would not have anything of, uh, of godly origin. Well, not only did he do that, but uh, history records that uh, uh, he went into the temple of God in Jerusalem and he erected an altar to Zeus. Let me give a parallel in our day and time. Suppose somebody brought in here a big shrine to Baal and put it right beside the pulpit. What would you do? Hopefully you get mad as, as Karn, as the old saying would go. Now, I see some in decoration, and I'm just going to use a side note. I see some people that are using little bells as decoration. Don't you ever do that. That is a disrespect to our holy God. That is paying tribute to an idol. And you say, well, it's just decoration. No, it's not decoration. It is a satanic inroad into your life, into your home, and don't do it. These little, these little things. But anyway, Antiochus Epiphanes, he went in and he put an altar in the temple of God to Zeus, which was a pagan and paganistic God. And uh, not only did he do that, but, you know, in, in Jewish culture, uh, pigs are forbidden. They have nothing to do with swine. God made it very clear. Well, what did he do? He went into the temple and he offered a pig on the altar in the temple. Now, that is going to be replicated, by the way, that is going to happen again in some fashion similar to that because the Bible makes it very clear. When you see the abomination of desolation take place, the Bible says, let the reader understand. Then the Bible says, get out of the city. In other words, it's not going to be very long before the Lord comes. And so he turned the temple into a place of prostitution. Can you imagine you could come to faith and you can get you a prostitute? Can you imagine going to Central and going to Emmanuel and going to some place and, and getting a prostitute? In other words, look at the degree of the wickedness of his heart and that gives you a little prototype of what the coming Antichrist is going to be. As a matter of fact, uh, he did everything abominable and, uh, you know, of course, God took him off the scenes. But still yet, he did his dirt. Now, sometimes we say, well, why don't God just take them out? God has his reasons. Now, the Antichrist is not going to rule forever, but he is going to have power. But there's a second prototype, and uh, many of us would uh, uh, understand it, is Adolf Hitler. Uh, he is one of the most intriguing and mystical men, probably, that has ever lived. If you ever want to read some of the background, some of the dark side of, uh, of Hitler, it's very intriguing. Uh, he was really a part of an occult, a black occult, and I won't go in, into that. But anyway, Hitler hated the Jews. Uh, and, and think about it. Who are the Jews? The Jews are God's people. And remember, Satan wants to wipe out anything that God has. So what is happening? Satan will launch an, an assault on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be surprised the more the church is assaulted. Why? Because it is designed of God. What is, think about it. What is Satan attacking? He is attacking home. Who established the home? God did. Who uh, established marriage between a husband and a, a man and a woman? God did. Who established who should be married? A man and a woman. God did. So what is Satan doing? He's attacking the home. He's attacking the fabric of who can be married. You know, if you want to be married to, you know, it's not to Adam and Steve or Eve and Cindy or all that. In other words, the backdrop of it is the working and the doing of Satan. That is his desire. That is his goal. And so uh, Satan hates anything of God. He hates the Jewish nation. He hates Israel. He hates Abraham. And so Satan, through, uh, through Hitler, wiped out six million Jews, 1.5 million children in the process of time. Why? Because he was under the control of God's arch enemy, Satan. Now, let me say this. I mentioned Antiochus Epiphanes. I mentioned Adolf Hitler. But can I tell you, these are going to be Sunday school boys 
compared to the Antichrist. They are going to be calm, cool, collected, nice individuals compared to what the Antichrist is going to do. And, uh, and, and when you look at their names and when you see what they've done, you know, it's very clear that Antiochus, Hitler, Mussolini, so many others, they hated God, they hate what God stood for, and that's the outdoing of Satan. When you find somebody says, well, you know, I love the Lord, but, you know, I'm for homosexuality. No, you don't love the Lord. He said, now, wait just a minute, Pastor. That's being naive. That's being close-minded. No. If you love God, you stand for what God stands for, Right? And so the reality of it is, Satan will even cause it. Well, I love the Lord, but. You know, I love the Lord, but we can have a little bit. There are always differences we can have. You know, I may like, uh, blue is my favorite color. And Sonny may say, no, Benny, you're wrong. Gray is the favorite color. It's the best color ever has been, is, and ever will be. I say, no, Sonny, you're wrong. Blue is the favorite color. And we may get so upset that it gets into a discussion. And, uh, but, uh, you know. And he'll say, well, I'm just sorry the pastor's wrong, you know. But there's a lot of things that don't really matter. But the point of the matter is, if you love God, you embrace what God embraces, right? And so that's exactly what Jesus makes clear. And so Satan wants people to embrace in the name of loving God. That, do you understand? That's why God said, Jesus said in Matthew 7, many will say to me in that day, didn't we do many wonderful works? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do... You see, miracles are not necessarily a sign that a person is of God. Don't you ever think for just a moment that, well, that person does miracles and and he's of God. Do you realize that Satan's antichrist and Satan can do wonders, the antichrist can do wonders? If you're looking for miracles, you can very well be very duped. Go all the way back to the Old Testament. You remember that Moses took the rod in his hand, he put it down and it turned into a serpent. And the magicians did the same thing by the black arts. Don't you dare not think Satan don't have power. Satan is going to have the full personification of the Antichrist and he is going to be Satan's greatest work. He's going to be the, the one in whom he has all of his authority and power. But look at the origin and the nature of the Antichrist. And, uh, you know, John and Paul make it very clear that the spirit of Antichrist is in the world now. And the spirit of Antichrist is even more. Uh, and, and it's very evident. It's very evident that, you know, you talk to just a... Listen to people who talk about their belief. Well, I just don't believe this. Folks, I didn't write the Bible. You didn't write the Bible. God wrote the Bible. And he didn't make it fuzzy, did he? Thou shalt not what? Have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. God didn't say, Benny, don't consider not doing that. You know, I grew up in a loving home. And a loving home has rules and commands. They don't have requests. Now, I don't mean that in a bad way. But when you're little, you take everything as the truth. You know, until mom and dad says, don't do that, that will hurt you, will harm you. So, let's look at the origin. First of all, the origin of the Antichrist. And uh, uh, in Revelation 13... John, under the inspiration of the Spirit, says, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And uh, and so what in the world, John, are you saying? Now, whenever he talks about the origin of the Antichrist, the beast, as it refers to here, rises up out of the sea. What is the sea? Is he rising up out of the water? Does he see a a beast like a dragon rise up out of the water? No, that's not what it means at all. Uh, Oftentimes, we don't use the Bible to interpret the Bible, and we get all messed up. What is the sea? Well, the sea represents people or multitudes or individuals. You can look back in Isaiah, I believe it's chapter 17 and chapter 57. Uh, the people are like a sea. Isaiah 57, 20 declares the wicked are like the troubled sea. The point is that John says, I saw the Antichrist rise up out of the sea, out of the multitude of peoples that are on the earth. And uh, the seven heads and ten horns, uh, and upon his horns ten crowns, and so, and, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And so when John is speaking, God is speaking through John, uh, he is saying that there is a power about him. A horn represents power. 
he probably rises with a smaller power among the other nations, uh, other leaders. But all of a sudden, he just begins to skyrocket. You know, there, there are some, as a matter of fact, in reading uh, about Adolf Hitler today, those who were closest to Hitler and one person who uh, even talked to a pastor that I read, he said, if you ever heard Hitler speak, He never spoke in private like he would speak in public. They said that his voice changed. His inflections changed. They said there was something about him that completely changed from private to public. Don't that sound like an empowerment by Satan? Sure it does. Think about it. Just as God fills his servants with his Holy Spirit, what does Satan do? Satan fills his host with his demonic spirit. And so... You know, Scripture says that uh, the crowns are representative of of dominion. And and here you have the ruler of the earth with great power. And uh, verse 1 declares that his head is uh, the name of blasphemy. Uh, When you look at uh, Revelation 17, 3, it declares that the beast is full of blasphemy. What does that mean? In other words, he is anti-God, anti-Christ through and through, mind, body, soul, and spirit. Every fiber of his being is given to the evil one. You see, there's not even a good thought about him. He don't even desire to do good, don't want to do good. And so the origin of the saint, he comes up from a sea of multitude, a sea of people. Second of all, look at the nature of the Antichrist. Now, when you read Revelation 17, 10, the Bible says there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet to come. Now, what is John saying? John is saying, I want you to know that there are empires that have already been And the one that I'm living in is, and another one is to come. So what are they? Well, John makes it very clear. And whenever you go back, if you're a historian, if you're a military person, if you know about kingdoms, Greece uh, was a kingdom that ruled the world in its day and time. Persia, Assyria, Babylon, Egypt. And the one that was in existence as John was writing was Rome. You know, even, even now... Rome was so powerful and so big and so encompassing, we even have a, have a phrase, we, it's 2,000 years after their power fell, or close to 2,000. All roads lead to what? Rome. In other words, when in Rome, what? Do as the Romans. We've got some things that we still have out of the overflow of uh, their rulership. And so uh, the one that was to come, it's going to be a revived Roman Empire. Now... I'm not an expert on this, but you can read Daniel and find out a great deal. Uh, Daniel said, and when he's talking about the different ones, he talks about uh, the ten toes. What are the ten toes? That's the ten world powers. And uh, some of the great uh, uh, students of the Word of God in history and and, uh, John MacArthur, Hal Lindsey, some others, uh, you know, and they talk about the ten nation confederacy. As a matter of fact, I was not too long ago that uh, you ever noticed uh, uh, that we're not using cash as much anymore? Do you know that they're not even printing as much cash, by the way? There was, I think, 10 or 15% less cash printed, I think it was last year, than there was the year before. You don't use as much cash as you. I don't. And uh, they'll give all sorts of reasons, but, you know, uh, Scripture makes it very clear. I mean, the time is coming where, you know, you'll have some type of something on your hand or on your forehead and they can scan you. You know, I mean, that's, you're already scanned in the hospital, aren't you? You know, you go in the room and they, you know, Walmart comes in and they scan you. You know, you're 298. You know, no, that's not Walmart, but they scan you. In other words, your barcode. You know, you got your barcode. And uh, that, that's becoming pretty normal. But things will happen what seems to be in a normal pace. And, and then the time will come. But, you know, but John said the one that would be to come would be the revived Roman Empire. And, uh, you know, of course, there's going to be a time, there's going to be a... But, but also, here's one of the realities, if you'll read uh, uh, people who are experts on finance, there's going to come a time when all the worlds are going to be linked together financial, and here's why. If you look at it real, real simply, you understand. Spain's economy affects Greece. Japan's economy affects the United States. You know, one coughs and other hiccups and all that, and they're all intermingled. For example, you know, something could go down, 
you're, you know, if you have a retirement, uh, don't matter who you are, if you have a retirement, it's based on the stock market. Don't matter who you are, don't matter, so no, mine's not, yes it is. If you draw any money whatsoever, it's based on the stock market. And when I was a kid, I always thought, why in the world is the stock market such a big thing? I was just a kid. I, but, you know, I mean, Dow is up. Dow is down. Dow is up. Here's the S&P. Here's all this. And I thought, what's the big deal? Because everything lives and dies by that. Well, you stop and think about it. As the nations are interspersed and uh, are, are interconnected. And so, uh, you know, you have the, the ten feder the ten uh, confederacy that's going to be the revived Roman Empire. And uh, that can be a complete study in and of itself. But look at the personality of the Antichrist. Now, I'm not going to uh, say like some, you know, I've, as I mentioned to you, some said, well, there's going, going to be a, evidently the appearance of the Antichrist August the 20th, 2016. There's no evidence in Scripture to that. Uh, but I also say there's no evidence in Scripture of not that. You know, the Bible just gives no dates. The Bible doesn't give any time frame. But here are some things about the Antichrist that you and I need to understand. First of all, he's an intellectual genius. Now, the Bible says in Daniel 7, 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in his horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Now, what does that mean? Intellectual genius. You say, where do you get that out of that verse? The word eyes in that verse have a reference to intellect. In other words, he is going to be an intellectual genius. How is he going to be? An because he is going to be the full personification of Satan and he is going to have the capability to run the whole world system. Do you remember the only other person that uh, conquered all the known worlds in his time and sat down and cried because there were no more co worlds to conquer? Do you remember who that person was? Does anybody remember? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered all the known worlds in his time and it's recorded that he sat down and cried because there were no more worlds to conquer. Well, what is this person going to be? He is going to be a world conqueror. How can you do that? You have to have an intellectual genius and it's going to come by Satan. Second of all, he is going to be a great communicator. The Bible says in verse 8, he, he speaks great things. The Bible says also in Daniel 7, 20, of the ten horns that was in his head of the others which came fell up and came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that hath eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. In other words, he had the capability to speak. He's going to have the capability to communicate. He's going to have an oratory unlike anybody else. Probably one of the greatest oratory uh, individuals that I've ever, ever known of or read of is uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. It said that Charles Haddon Spurgeon had a vocabulary of 25,000 words. Uh, I don't know what the average person has, maybe 10,000 words, but he had a tremendous, tremendous vocabulary. But he is going to have the ability to convince, to communicate. If you'll listen to some of Adolf Hitler's speeches, and by the way, go back and listen. It's amazing how he starts off. Under the power of Satan, he starts off with a whisper. And people lean over to listen. All of a sudden, he, he whips them into shape. And, and, you know, he gets them to believe what they never would believe and, and, and to conquer what they never thought they could. And then thirdly, he uses flattery to obtain his kingdom. He's a masterful politician. He'll be a commercial guru. Uh, he'll have the ability to create a one-world economy. And it seems like he'll be able to do it with ease. He'll be a military genius. He'll, tread the ability, he'll have the ability to tread the earth. And uh, sixth, his personality is compared to three animals. Now think about it. He, a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Uh, what so? Uh, well, a leopard uh, moves swiftly. A bear, full of strength. And uh, a lion, tenacious and fierce. And so that's, that's going to be who he is. And then in, in Revelation 13, 4, I'm going to stop after this verse. But I want you to notice the worship of the Antichrist. Watch this. 13, 4. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? 
who is able to make war with him. Now, here's the picture. Here is somebody that nobody on earth has the capability to conquer. He's not just a human being. He is the embodiment of Satan's finest deceit, lies, trickery. And he has all the power that Satan can emanate and bring into his being. Can't you imagine men and women all over the earth bowing down to the Antichrist? Some, if he was on the world stage right now, if he was in power right now, there'd be some of our own friends and family that would throw away their Bibles to bow down to him. Why? Because they're not really belong to God in the first place. You see, the Bible says, those who, if you, if you don't have something real, you're not going to withstand. That's why persecution purges the church and purifies the church. You say, what do you mean, persecution? Well, think about it. Let's say uh, you, you start experiencing persecution, and maybe the government says, uh, you're going to have to stay home, you go to church, you're going to be fine, you're going to be in prison. You know what a lot of people do? Well, you don't have to find me. I stay from home from church anyway. You know, I've said, heard, said this before. 16 drops of rain will keep 17 Baptists out of church any day of the week. Why? Because a lot of people don't have anything. And so when persecution comes, you don't, you don't, you don't stand if there's not something there. And that's why fake Christians are not going to stand. That's why they're going to cave. Listen, do you remember what John said? They went out from among us because what? They were not part of us. And that's why we need to pray for people. Well, you know, they're a Christian and they don't ever come to church. Are you sure? A Christian will come to church. A Christian will make it his business to be in the house of God. We've got a lot of church members, but a lot don't have time for church. And so it leaves their salvation suspect. Listen. Like I heard someone say, if you don't want to go to church with someone, then it's a good probability you're not really interested in going to heaven with them. And so, but the worship of the Antichrist. Well, our time is out. But I want you to read Revelation 13. I want you to read Revelation 17 as we conclude next Wednesday night on the Antichrist, the ultimate world leader. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. That though we may know the Antichrist is coming, we know that he's going to be defeated by the breath of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we know what the end of the story is. And we know that sin is going to finally be played out. And it's going to be dealt with finally, fully, and forever. And Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to find their place in the lake of fire. And they're going to be there for all of eternity. And they're going to pay for their sin for all of eternity. And all the wicked and all the evil and all the ungodly. But Father, as the church, may we stand. May we gain a new understanding why we're attacked. Because Satan hates everything that belongs to God. And Lord, we ought to count it a badge of honor and courage if people say things against us. Because that's reminded that we look like our Lord. And we're acting like our Lord and behaving like our Lord. Oh, Father, may we live obediently 